going to talk to you about Cosmic today. Uh, we're working to make micromobility for everyone. So I think before I start, a little bit of context and my story. Uh, I'm not a transportation expert at all. I see myself much more as a problem solver than anything else. Uh, about three and a half years ago, I took a trip to Colombia, the country, and was meeting a lot of really, really smart people and having a really good time. Uh, but what I started noticing was that there were people who were trained in electronics engineering, mechatronics, electromechanical, and most of them were working in uh, administration or marketing or something of the sort. So it dawned on me that very skilled and, and talented people didn't have opportunity. About six months later, I moved to Bogota. I took a house and got a group of engineers together and part of the compensation package was you got to live for free. We didn't actually know what we were working on, but I knew that I wanted to work on something, right? And there was kind of two filters where we, we had to put our energy into. The first of which was it had to have high social impact and because we are a business, it had to be a viable business. So that's how we landed on Cosmic. Uh, Cosmic ended up being the first shared e-scooters in Colombia. And after doing this and, and piloting it, we realized that we created the same problem that we wanted to solve, is to bring opportunity to people, but we were only servicing a very small part of the population, people who, who could actually afford and access these vehicles. So we got a little more meta, and we looked at Latin America as an entire region. And there's about 700 million people living in Latin America. 68% of them have access to smartphones, which was really good news for us because micromobility requires some, some tech. But 70% of them are unbanked or underbanked. Underbanked means you have very limiting uh, bank accounts, sometimes no debit cards, basically an inability to be a part of the, the new digital transaction world, even if you have a bank account. And obviously, micro-mobility these days, especially the free-floating models, requires uh, smartphones with data, so we were good there. But it also requires credit cards or debit cards, so we had a little bit of an issue. Effectively, shared e-scooters and micro-mobility is not accessible to everyone. Um, it's okay. I mean, that's how technology works in general, right? Everything is a step-by-step -step process. But it was working against what the original mission was of starting Cosmic and, and trying to bring opportunity to people who otherwise wouldn't get it. So as a company, we sat together and said, OK, what are we going to do to solve this problem? And he said, all right, we have the answer. We need a mobility digital wallet, right? That's logical. At least that's what we assumed. And so we built this fancy digital wallet function into our app, and we connected to a bunch of alternate payment methods, cash deposit systems, uh, new bank style systems, digital banking systems. And at the end of the day, the reality was we were still servicing the exact same demographics in the same areas, within the same polygons, the same operating zones. And we, we didn't shift what we wanted to do, even though we had a new feature. And on top of that, just listening to the panel, we realized, I'm, I'm saying this now, I realized we didn't communicate very well that people had the opportunity to actually access these systems. So it seems like there's a bigger issue at hand, which is trust. Trust and communication, right? There's this mainstream stream assumption that the second and third tier markets that actually do need access to these types of, of mobility solutions don't have the spending the power or they don't have the, the enough usage to actually be a part of this and be viable from a business perspective. And it's completely understandable, right? Because I'm coming from the private sector, uh, the other players in the space are all in the private sector, and everyone wants to grow a business as fast as possible. The way you do that, it's a land grab, it's territory, it's user acquisition, and it's, it's the numbers that everyone's looking for. So I'll give you an example. On the left, we have Santiago, which is a metropolitan city in Chile, uh, which has about six operators kind of coexisting, all within the exact same zones. And on the right side, we have Viña del Mar, which is a very interesting case study because it has a big floating population of tourism, weekend warriors, uh, and it has an even bigger population of the service industry that's actually supporting all of that. And those are the people who need access to these types of solutions. So the problem wasn't the unbanked. 
right? The problem was the unserviced. Just huge groups of people that the people bringing the solutions and the companies bringing the solutions to market were overlooking for business reasons or other agendas. What's funny though is, just logically, on-demand vehicle rentals appeals to the cash flow conscious. So the groups of people that we're all avoiding getting in front of are the exact groups of people who actually need this, want this, and do have the spending power to be a part of, uh, because they are very much cash flow conscious. So we had to kind of reevaluate the way we were doing our business. I think all in all, we did a really good job. Uh, first things first, we had to focus on unit economics. Most of shared mobility uses this logic of disposable vehicles where just blast out as many vehicles as possible and the vehicle lifespan is extremely short. Industry average tends to be about two to four months, which is horrendous. A go-kart could last longer than a scooter these days. Uh, so we had to put a little bit of attention there and we made partnerships with Israeli design firms and really good factories in China and we started producing ruggedized vehicles specifically built for the sharing economy. The second thing was we had to reduce risk. So trust uh, kind of goes hand in hand with the concept of risk. Through our platform, uh, we built a lot of software solutions to prevent theft, uh, vandalism, and we made partnerships with insurance companies to not only protect the value of the vehicles from the operator's perspective, but to also protect the riders who are getting around, because most of these systems don't actually have rider insurance. So let's say you come from an underprivileged community and you get in a car accident uh, or you hit a, a very high-end car like a Mercedes, who's paying for that? The terms of service typically say you are as an individual. Uh, we started doing live patrol, meaning people were going around and actually stopping and preventing uh, theft and vandalism in real time before it happened. And then finally, real-time network monitoring as well uh, to make sure that we were integrating with our, our patrollers on the street. And finally, we're a small company. So we didn't raise $100 million, uh, but we have big visions and big ambitions to help service this industry. And so we started recruiting help. And the first place we focused was on local entrepreneurs and businesses who actually knew these areas very well. And we built a kind of franchise model to offload a lot of the operations that they can do way better than we can because they actually understand the nuances of these environments. And then we started looking a little bit higher and we started working with uh, corporations and startups like Glovo, who has a very similar image to us. Glovo is a uh, last mile delivery service similar to an Uber Eats. They're doing very well throughout the world, but they've made a big business out of entering markets that everyone else is overlooking. Because of this, this kind of methodology and this change in perspective, now we're accessing 35 unserviced towns and cities around the globe, and we're doing exactly what our goal was. Because ultimately, transportation and opportunity go hand in hand, right? Just, you don't have to put up your hands or anything like that, but just think for a second. When's the last time you lost a job because you couldn't get to work? Or when's the last time you had a major uh, health problem within your family because you couldn't get to the hospital. That's what transportation really, really represents. And I think through trial and error and a lot of experiences as to what doesn't work, we kind of came back to our roots of bringing opportunity back to those who normally don't get it. Thank you.